Thank you very much for this great honor to be with so many people who are trying to change the world. Uh, as you see, it's very ambitious. I'm asking whether we can really have a sustainable golden age, and that in terms of reshaping globalization and redesigning well-being, quite a tall order. So the question, first question, how feasible is sustainable global growth? Is full globalization, I mean the whole world incorporated, is it compatible with the so-called American way of life? Why do we and so many people around the world think that the American way of life is the best? Could there be better? Could there be others? Could they coexist? Well, I'm going to argue today that understanding technological revolutions and paradigm shifts could help answer some of those questions. We have a crucial relationship to examine, and that is the relationship between technology and society. If you look at history, you do the historical analysis, it reveals a process of mutual shaping in a periodically changing context. We have had five technological revolutions in 240 years. The first was the Industrial Revolution, machines, factories, canals, textiles, at the end of the 18th century, beginning in 1771. Then we had the next, beginning in 1829, with the contest for the steam engine for the railways, the age of steam, coal, iron, and railways. From 1875, we have the age of steel, and heavy engineering, electrical, chemical, civil, naval. It was a huge, that was the first globalization. The steamships going all the way to the south and developing Australia, New Zealand, Argentina, and creating the first world markets for produce. Then from 1908, with Henry Ford's Model T, we had the age of the automobile, oil, petrochemicals, and mass production. And now, since Intel's microprocessor in 1971, we are in the age of information technology and telecommunications. I did not make a mistake with the arrow. This revolution is only halfway through. We still have a whole half. But that's all we have. Because very soon, very likely, in about 30 years perhaps, we will have the age of biotech, bioelectronics, nanotech, and new materials. I guess. It's a good guess. It's based on historical experience about how much of the next revolution is already around when you're about halfway in the previous. Each of these begins in a core country. The first two were in Britain, the next one in three countries, Britain, USA, and Germany, vying for leadership the next two in the USA, and the next one, who knows, USA, Europe, both other. Each takes 40 to 60 years to spread across the, world, across the world and reach maturity. Now, why do we call them revolutions? I mean, there are lots of very important technologies that come across. Why do we call these particular ones? What gives them the possibility of being revolutions? It's because they don't just do their job of their technologies, their products. It's because they transform the whole economy. And that is because each of these has a double nature. On the one hand, we have the new industries. They're the ones that are really visible. On the other, we have a new paradigm for all. We have a new logic, a new common sense for every other activity, no matter what. So on the one hand, the super visible, powerful cluster of visible new and dynamic industries and infrastructures. Everyone has brought a new infrastructure. Ours is the internet. 
we had uh, railways before and so on. In each one, electricity in the, and roads and the roadworks and airports in the previous and so on. These bring explosive growth and structural change. Now, what's the new paradigm? The new paradigm is a set of new generic technologies and infrastructures together with organizational principles, networks, empowerment, this and that and the other, capable of modernizing the existing industries too. All the old ones, they don't stay behind, they modernize. And so do governments, by the way, applying those same principles that the companies apply to modernize. So what we get is a quantum jump in innovation and productivity potential for every single industry, every single activity, every single organization across society. So we're really talking about a massive techno-economic paradigm shift, changing the opportunity space and reshaping society. What is it really? What is a techno-economic paradigm shift if we have to define it? It is the appearance of an enormous new wealth-creating potential, enabling and requiring a change in the direction of change, a change in the direction of change across all industries and gradually across society a far-reaching transformation indeed. Each paradigm shift brings new ways of producing, a new way of working, new ways of transport and communication, a new way of living. Each generation then sees itself as the embodiment of progress and comfort and sees the previous way of living as old-fashioned and backward. Ask the young about telecommunications and their mobile phones and all these things and all of us dinosaurs not really being as competent as they are. That really, that is what the whole, the whole movement of paradigm shifts brings about. Now, each techno I, I'm going to talk mainly about patterns of living, new ways of living. I'm sure you know a lot about what has changed in new ways of producing. So each revolution provides a new interrelated set of life-shaping goods and services at affordable prices. And it's very important that it's because it's at affordable prices that things diffuse. They begin very expensive among the rich, and then with economies of scale and economies of scope and economies of all sorts of things, they become cheaper and then they can spread. The age of steam, coal, iron and railways brought Victorian living. Victorian living was designed by the British middle classes, an industry-based urban lifestyle, different from that of the country-based aristocracy, and it spread to the upper classes elsewhere. In the next age of steel heavy engineering, the first globalization, we had the Belle Epoque. The Belle Epoque, the British, European, and American upper and middle classes, established the cosmopolitan lifestyle, spreading to the upper classes of the whole world. The age of the automobile, oil, petrochemicals, and mass production, established the American way of life. The American upper and middle classes grew a suburban energy intensive lifestyle spreading for the first time to the working classes. This was the first time that the style of living that was created out of technological revolutions actually came down to the working classes of all the advanced countries and also to the middle classes of most of the developing world. Now we are in the age of information technology and telecommunications and I'm asking you whether we think that we're going to create sustainable global lifestyles. 
Will the affluent educated classes of the developed and emerging countries establish an ICT intensive knowledge society with a variety of environmentally friendly lifestyles and consumption patterns that will spread across the working classes of the advanced world and into the whole of the global economy, into all these masses that are entering consumption in China and Asia, in, in the whole of Asia and much of Latin America and some of Africa, will it really happen? Will globalization really happen for all? Or is it going to have limits that will not allow it to happen? One of them, of course, the environmental limit. Now, each of those styles that comes with each of those revolutions shapes the desires and dreams of the majority. That moves people up to having those things. And once they have them, like the, advanced, like the workers in the advanced countries did in the 60s, for instance, there is this feeling of well-being that is achieved as you move through the income scale with a set of affordable conveniences for what is considered the good life. Let's look at the emergence of the American way of life as a paradigm shifts from the, ten, from the 1910s so you see what it's about, how big this sort of change is. Uh, society moved from energy scarce living, energy expensive and often inaccessible, to energy intensive homes and mobility when energy was cheap and its availability unlimited. From trains, horses, carriages, stagecoaches, ships and bicycles to automobiles, buses, trucks, airplanes and motorcycles. From local newspapers, posters, theaters and parties for entertainment to mass media, radio, movies and television. From ice boxes and coal stoves to refrigerators and central heating from doing housework by hand to doing housework with electrical equipment, from natural materials, cotton, wool, leather, silk, to synthetic materials, from paper, cardboard, wool, and glass packaging, to a preference for disposable plastics of all sorts, from fresh food bought daily from specialized suppliers, to refrigerated, frozen, or preserved food bought periodically in supermarkets, from urban or country living, and working, you either lived and worked in the country or lived and worked in the city, to suburban, suburban living separate from work, a sort of dormitory society where you have this big separation with big distances. Why could you have the distances? Because energy was cheap and you could move around in automobiles. All this was strongly aided by advertising, business strategies, and government policies. This did not just happen. There was a whole convergent action from advertising, business, and government to get this move to this new way of living. If you take it all together, we are still living that way. Now, <coughs> the current paradigm shift taking place since the 1970s should take us from the logic of cheap energy for transport, electricity, and synthetic materials to the logic of cheap information processing and telecommunications as a general shaper of our way of living. There should be a radical change in the innovation there is in the innovation opportunity space and in the, 